Hi there, you guys, checking in for your daily quar inspiration. Um, so let me let me just go right to our poem, and it's one you're going to recognize. There we are, Rumi's the guest house. A lot of you wrote about this, and um, I know that a lot of you really loved this poem, so I thought it would be a good one to check in on again. The guest house. This being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture. Still, treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whatever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. So remember loving this poem when we read it last semester, and we talked a lot about it in that the extended metaphor and how it's about no matter what emotions are coming into your house, which is of course just yourself, no matter what emotions you're experiencing, Rumi says you should accept them all and kind of just let them be. And we talked about how a guest house is kind of like an, an inn, right? So um, they don't stay forever guests nor your emotions, right? So they pass through. So you just have to kind of experience them and let them move on. But also the idea of not repressing any of the negative emotions that you might be feeling. So um, I feel like we're all kind of going through some some crazy feelings and thoughts in this in this unprecedented kind of space and it's good to just be with them. And I would even encourage you to journal or write about them. That always helps. So that is our inspiration for today. Rumi's the guest house. I'll just remind you that none of this is anything you're gonna be tested on. This is just kind of for fun to touch base and let you know that I'm thinking about you. Let me switch over to um, Tuesdays with Mari. So this is where we left off yesterday. If you didn't see yesterday's videos and you want to start from the beginning, Tuesdays with Mari, you can, but otherwise I'm just going to pick up here and we'll read for a little bit. The fall semester passed quickly. The pills increased. Therapy became a regular routine. Nurses came to his house to work with Maury's withering legs to keep the muscles active, bending them back and forth as if pumping water from a well. Massage specialists came by once a week to try to soothe the constant heavy stiffness he felt. He met with meditation teachers and closed his eyes and narrowed his thoughts until his world shrunk down to a single breath in and out, in and out. One day, using his cane, he stepped onto the curb and fell over into the street. The cane was exchanged for a walker. As his body weakened, the back and forth to the bathroom became too exhausting, so Maury began to urinate into a large beaker. He had to support himself as he did this, meaning someone had to hold the beaker while Maury filled it. Most of us would be embarrassed by all this, especially at Maury's age, but Maury was not like most of us. When some of his close colleagues would visit, he would say to them, listen, I have to pee. Would you mind helping? Are you okay with that? Often, to their own surprise, they were. In fact, he entertained a growing stream of visitors. He had discussion groups about dying, what it really meant, how societies had always been afraid of it without necessarily understanding it. He told his friends that if they really wanted to help him, they would treat him not with sympathy, but with visits, phone calls, a sharing of their problems, the way they had always shared their problems, because Maury had always been a wonderful listener. For all that was happening to him, his voice was strong and inviting, and his mind was vibrating with a million thoughts. He was intent on proving that the word dying was not synonymous with useless. 
The new year came and went. Although he never said it to anyone, Maury knew this would be the last year of his life. He was using a wheelchair now and he was fighting time. He was fighting time to say all the things he wanted to say to all the people he loved. When a colleague at Brandeis died suddenly of a heart attack, Maury went to his funeral. He came home depressed. What a waste, he said. All those people saying all those wonderful things and Irv never got to hear any of it. Maury had a better idea. He made some calls. He chose a date. And on a cold Sunday afternoon, he was joined in his home by a small group of friends and family for a living funeral. Each of them spoke and paid tribute to my old professor. Some cried, some laughed. One woman read a poem. My dear and loving cousin, your ageless heart as you move through time, layer on layer, tender sequoia. Maury cried and laughed with them. And all the heartfelt things we never get to say to those we love, Maury said that day. His living funeral was a rousing success. Only Maury wasn't dead yet. In fact, the most unusual part of his life was about to unfold. The student. At this point, I should explain what had happened to me since that summer day when I last hugged my dear and wise professor and promised to keep in touch. I did not keep in touch. In fact, I lost contact with most of the people I knew in college, including my beer drinking friends and the first woman I ever woke up with in the morning. The years after graduation hardened me into someone quite different from the strutting graduate who left campus that day, headed for New York City, ready to offer the world his talent. The world, I discovered, was not all that interested. I wandered around my early 20s, paying rent and reading classifieds and wondering why the lights were not turning green for me. My dream was to be a famous musician. I played the piano. But after several years of dark, empty nightclubs, broken promises, bands that kept breaking up, and producers who seemed excited about everyone but me, the dream soured. I was failing for the first time in my life. At the same time, I had my first serious encounter with death. My favorite uncle, my mother's brother, the man who had taught me music, taught me to drive, teased me about girls, thrown me a football, that one adult whom I targeted as a child and said, that's who I want to be when I grow up, died of pancreatic cancer at the age of 44. He was short. He was a short, handsome man with a thick mustache, and I was with him for the last year of his life, living in an apartment just below his. I watched his strong body wither, then bloat, saw him suffer, night after night, doubled over at the dinner table, pressing on his stomach, his eyes shut, his mouth contorted in pain. Ah, God, he would moan. Ah, Jesus. The rest of us, my aunt, his two young sons, me, stood there silently, cleaning the plates, averting our eyes. It was the most helpless I have ever felt in my life. One night in May, my uncle and I sat on the balcony of his apartment. It was breezy and warm. He looked out toward the horizon and said through gritted teeth that he wouldn't be around to see his kids into the next school year. He asked if I would look after them. I told him not to talk that way. He stared at me sadly. He died a few weeks later. After the funeral, my life changed. I felt as if time were suddenly precious, water going down an open drain, and I could not move quickly enough. No more playing music at half-empty nightclubs. No more writing songs in my apartment, songs that no one would hear. I returned to school. I earned a master's degree in journalism and took the first job offered as a sports writer. Instead of chasing my own fame, I wrote about famous athletes chasing theirs. I worked for newspapers and freelanced for magazines. I worked at a pace that knew no hours, no limits. 
I would wake up in the morning, brush my teeth, and sit down at the typewriter in the same clothes I had slept in. My uncle had worked for a corporation and hated it. Same thing every day. And I was determined never to end up like him. I bounced around from New York to Florida and eventually took a job in Detroit as a columnist for the Detroit Free Press. The sports appetite in that city was insatiable. They had professional teams in football, basketball, baseball, and hockey, and it matched my ambition. In a few years, I was not only penning columns, I was writing sports books, doing radio shows, and appearing regularly on TV, spouting my opinions on rich football players and hypocritical college sports programs. I was part of the media thunderstorm that now soaks our country. I was in demand. I stopped renting. I started buying. I bought a house on a hill. I bought cars. I invested in stocks and built a portfolio. I was cranked to a fifth gear and everything I did, I did on a deadline. I exercised like a demon. I drove my car at breakneck speed. I made more money than I had ever figured to see. I met a dark haired woman named Janine who somehow loved me despite my schedule and the constant absences. We were married after a seven year courtship. I was back to work a week after the wedding. I told her and myself that we would one day start a family, something she wanted very much, but that day never came. Instead, I buried myself in accomplishments because with accomplishments, I believe I could control things. I could squeeze in every last piece of happiness before I got sick and died, like my uncle before me, which I figured was my natural fate. As for Maury, well, I thought about him now and then, the things he had taught me about being human and relating to others, but it was always in the distance, as if from another life. Over the years, I threw away any mail that came from Brandeis University, figuring they were only asking for money. So I did not know of Maury's illness. The people who might have told me were long forgotten their phone numbers buried in some packed away box in the attic. It might have stayed that way had I not been flicking through the TV channels late one night when something caught my ear. The audio visual. In March of 1995, a limousine carrying Ted Koppel, the host of ABC TV's Nightline, pulled up to the snow covered curb outside Maury's house in West Newton, Massachusetts. Maury was in a wheelchair full time now, getting used to helpers lifting him like a heavy sack from the chair to the bed and the bed to the chair. He had begun to cough while eating and chewing was a chore. His legs were dead. He would never walk again. Yet he refused to be depressed. Instead, Maury had become a lightning rod of ideas. He jotted down his thoughts on yellow pads, envelopes, folders, scrap paper. He wrote bite-sized phil phil philosophies about living with death's shadow. Accept what you are able to do and what you are not able to do. Accept the past as past without denying it or discarding it. Learn to forgive yourself and to forgive others. Don't assume that it's too late to get involved. After a while, he had more than 50 of these aphorisms, which he shared with his friends. One friend, a fellow Brandeis professor named Maury Stein, was so taken with the words that he sent them to a Boston Globe reporter who came out and wrote a long feature story on Maury. The headline read, a professor's final course, his own death. The article caught the eye of a producer from the Nightline show who brought it to Koppel in Washington, DC. Take a look at this, the producer said. Next thing you knew, there were cameramen in Maury's living room and Koppel's limousine was in front of the house. Several of Maury's friends and family members had gathered to meet Koppel and when the famous man entered the house, they buzzed with excitement. All except Maury, who wheeled himself forward, 
raised his eyebrows and interrupted the clamor with his high sing-song voice. Ted, I need to check you out before I agree to do this interview. There was an awkward moment of silence. Then the two men were ushered into the study. The door was shut. Man, one friend whispered outside the door. I hope Ted goes easy on Maury. I hope Maury goes easy on Ted, said the other. Inside the office, Maury motioned for Koppel to sit down. He crossed his hands in his lap and smiled. Tell me something close to your heart, Maury began. My heart? Koppel studied the old man. All right, he said cautiously, and he spoke about his children. They were close to his heart, weren't they? Good, Maury said. Now tell me something about your faith. Koppel was uncomfortable. I usually don't talk about such things with people I've only known a few minutes. Ted, I'm dying, Maury said, peering over his glasses. I don't have a lot of time here. Koppel laughed. All right, Faith. He quoted a passage from Marcus Aurelius, something he felt strongly about. Maury nodded. Now let me ask you something, Koppel said. Have you ever seen my program? Maury shrugged. Twice, I think. Twice? That's all? Don't feel bad. I've only seen Oprah once. Well, the two times you saw my show, what did you think? Maury paused. To be honest? Yes. I thought you were a narcissist. Koppel burst into laughter. I'm too ugly to be a narcissist, he said. Soon the cameras were rolling in front of the living room fireplace with Koppel in his crisp blue suit and Maury in his shaggy gray sweater. He had refused fancy clothes or makeup for this interview. His philosophy was that death should not be embarrassing. He was not about to powder its nose. Because Maury sat in the wheelchair, the camera never caught his withered legs. And because he was still able to move his hands, Maury always spoke with both hands waving, he showed great passion when explaining how you face the end of life. Ted, he said, when all this started, I asked myself, am I going to withdraw from the world like most people do, or am I going to live? I decided I'm going to live, or at least try to live, the way I want, with dignity, with courage, with humor, with composure. There are some mornings when I cry and cry and mourn for myself. Some mornings I'm so angry and bitter, but it doesn't last too long. Then I get up and say, I want to live. So far, I've been able to do it. Will I be able to continue? I don't know, but I'm betting on myself that I will. Koppel seemed extremely taken with Maury. He asked about the humility that death induced. Well, Fred, Maury said accidentally, then he quickly corrected himself. I mean, Ted. Now that's inducing humility, Koppel said, laughing. The two men spoke about the afterlife. They spoke about Maury's increasing dependency on other people. He already needed help eating and sitting and moving from place to place. What, Koppel asked, did Maury dread the most about his slow, insidious decay? Maury paused. He asked if he could say this certain thing on television. Koppel said, go ahead. Maury looked straight into the eyes of the most famous interviewer in America. Well, Ted, one day soon, someone's going to have to wipe my ass. The program aired on a Friday night. It began with Ted Koppel from behind the desk in Washington, his voice booming with authority. Who is Maury Schwartz, he said, and why, by the end of the night, are so many of you going to care about him? A thousand miles away, in my house on the hill, I was casually flipping channels. I heard these words from the TV set, Who is Maury Schwartz? And went numb. That seems like a good place to stop for today, you guys. So tune in tomorrow to listen to more. And in the meantime, have a good day. Read your books, maybe do some writing or journaling or something. 
and um, rest up. Hope you guys are doing well. Take care.